Hey there, it's time for voiceover body shop tech talk number 48 or nine. I think I see nine on my thing. I, I think it's tech talk number 49. It's getting up there. We've been doing tech talk now for two years now. And yep. uh, you guys love it. We're here. If you've got a question for us about your home voiceover studio or about equipment or about what's the best microphone for voiceover, don't ask that one. Uh, they'll try to answer it yeah throw it in the chat room and uh, we will get to that a little bit later on in the show because it's not this i can tell you that right now what, what what is that it's an airpod pro oh okay yeah okay well we'll be talking about that too and we've got uh, all sorts of interesting stuff as far as uh you know george's tech update you've got some cool things i see in there and <laughs> We're also going to talk about setting levels because I guess we haven't talked about it enough. Because it's a new year, I, it's a new time to talk about setting levels. All right. Absolutely. So anyway, stay tuned. It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together... From the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master. A professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great-sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to thrive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Greetings all. I am Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B S Tech Talk Talk Tech Tech Talk Talk Tech Talk. We're talking tech on VOBS Tech Talk. Anything to do with home voiceover studios or voiceover technology, we're the guys to ask. I mean, where else are you gonna go? I mean, we have been utterly obsessed with this topic for a very, very long time. Yeah, after you 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 hear so much stuff every day, and it's like. We, we, we tried to standardize it and make it simple for everybody. Yet you guys seem to want to make it more complicated. I don't quite get that. You know, I, we get these, I, I'm going to use this piece of equipment and I want to use this. And it's like, the secret to it is learning how to do it right up front and getting your environment right and all these other things. But how do you learn how to do that? Well, you could try all sorts of things until someone says, yeah, okay, your audio sounds right. Or you could go to the guys that actually do this every day and know what it takes to make things sound right. You know, it's not a trial and error thing. There are some standard things that George and I know how to do that make it easy for you. And I think that's probably what you and I do better than anybody else You know, that I've talked to. We don't try to overcomplicate it. It's like, here's how you use this. Here's how you use that. You know, here's how we can improve the sound in the booth you're in. I mean, it doesn't have to be sophisticated. I mean, we had Will Lyman on last week and, you know, thinking, oh, well, here's, here's one of the top guys in the biz. He's probably got a great booth and I, no, he's in his closet. That's right. You know, I mean, he treated it right. 
and clearly it works. He wasn't even using a really sophisticated microphone sometimes. You know, I mean, he was doing front line on a blue snowball. When, or no, yeah, he it, uses the Yeti in the car when he has to. Yeah. Snowball, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but if if you really want to learn how to do it right, well, one, you've come to the right place because you're watching voiceover body shop tech talk because we talk about all this stuff. And clearly you guys like listening to us talk. Otherwise, we wouldn't keep doing it. Uh, but if you'd like to work with us individually, if you really want to work with a pro, somebody who can really get you from not knowing what you're doing to maybe not necessarily knowing what you're doing, but when you hit the button on record, it's going to do it right anyway. You can Everybody work. thinks you know what you're doing when they That's hear the right. result. Right, exactly. You know, nobody needs to see how it's done. It's just as long as it sounds good, it is good, as we like to say. But if they want to work with you, George, how do they do that? Well, you can head over to georgethe.tech. That's my website for tech support. And there's a new one coming soon. A new website coming soon. It is in it is in the very early beta testing stages, but hopefully it'll be available for you guys to peruse soon enough. Um, but right now it's available to book services. You can send in files for a sound check. Uh, you can have me tune your booth and give you acoustical design tips for your closet or booth or whatever your space is. And that's all at georgethe.tech. Dan, he has a cup you can send in specimens. And yeah. he do that over at? Uh, that is over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. And uh, go over there and you'll see all the services I offer. I do full consultations with you where I will teach you from nothing to actually being competent at recording because it's not as hard as you think because we cut through all the BS and just make sure that you understand what it takes to do it right and make it sound good. And as George was saying, I do have the specimen collection cup. If you've got your booth set up and you think you're recording great, it's amazing some of the stuff I see that comes out of people's booths. Uh, you, for $25, I will give you a full analysis of your audio and offer some suggestions on how to get it sounding as good as Will Lineman or as some of the other great voiceover people out there. Because it's it's not the equipment, it's how you use it. Right? That's right. Mic placement, mic placement, mic placement. Acoustics, acoustics, acoustics. Location, location, location. And setting <laughs> your levels properly, which we will talk about a little bit later. But anyway, it's time for your tech update and an update from last week's update. That's right. Oh, there's the update theme. It's almost too long as it is, and it's only 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Well, we had a question about the annoyance of using headphones with cords. And, you know, we've talked plenty of times about maybe you don't need to wear headphones when you voice act. But for a lot of folks, having headphones on is still part of the game and so I looked into it. I looked into it. How would you have wireless headphones that would still sound as good as the ones that you're used to using and have none of the issues of a wireless headphone? Now, you know, a lot of people are going to, if you start Googling, by the way, you're not going to find studio or professional quality wireless studio monitor headphones. They, they literally don't exist. They, they, nobody makes them. <laughs> it's really interesting. You can get um, Bluetooth that are pro quality, um, you can go buy the Apple Bluetooth headphones, um, but that doesn't make pro audio quality that you can use while recording. The problem with all those Bluetooth based systems is there's a big latency between when you speak and what you would actually hear back. Well, not huge, but enough that would really screw up what you're monitoring in your headphones. It would throw you off big time. So don't use Bluetooth in the studio. Now you can use it while you're editing, but even then it's not great. So I started looking into it. Well, live performers on stage, they use wireless IEMs in your monitor systems. They've been doing that for a long time. But I also knew that those systems are really stinking expensive. Like just to getting the transmitter and the receiver, the pro quality ones generally five, six hundred dollars or more, then you have to put your headphones, then you have to get headphones too, right? So but I did find um, the prices are coming down, and there is a set that is uh, a wireless receiver system that is becoming 
reasonably priced now. There's a company called X Vive, X V I V E, um, and it's the Audio U4 wireless system. It's around two hundred and thirty to ish dollars, um, and it allows you to send audio wirelessly from your equipment. It has an XLR jack, so many of you may need to use an adapter cable to go to quarter inch or something else, but it will then allow you to send that audio uh, wirelessly to a pack that you would wear on your belt probably and have control over your headphone level. And the audio quality is extremely high quality. It's again, there's not really studio quality systems for this really, um, but it is they all, by all reports that I've read going to give you quality that's really totally on par with what it would sound like if you were hardwired in. Maybe a problem that very few people really have, but it did come up, so I thought I would see what I could find. Do you think you had ever used something like that, Dan? Or kind I of tried silly. using it tonight, and I they weren't charged. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a problem. Like anything wireless, now you have something else yeah, to charge. Charge exactly. Yeah. Oh, it is a pain that you know to use wireless stuff, but yeah, I mean, I, the, only, the only wireless stuff I probably use is my my mouse, and that's mm -hmm. about uh everything i else. have a wireless tripod and i'd be i would be very happy to plug it in if they had a way to do that right <laughs> charge the batteries yeah so yeah it's um yeah wireless is it doesn't really have a place yeah i think in the the workflow for your general voice actor unless of course it does i mean i can think of another thing like if you're doing a lot a lot of like commercial work that you're being remotely directed a lot of times what happens is they'll say, okay, let's get approval from the client. And you're stuck right. waiting for that moment when they say, oh, this, we're going to do it again. So in that case, maybe having wireless headphones could be kind of nice. You could wander out of the booth and you could, you know, at least know what's going on. But yeah, that would be the only case I can think of. That would really be that helpful. Um, and I kind of been looking forward to what's coming in terms of microphone technology Neumann pretty much figured out how to make a mic capsule and everything about 80 years ago. That Those aren't getting any better, right? That's We kind of figured that out. But there's, there are some modern technologies that are being boiled into microphones now. And some of these are almost becoming literally studios in a mic. Um, one that popped up on my radar today when I was looking online um, is the Presonus Revelator. And I can't in any way vouch for the sound quality. And I will start off by saying I don't recommend buying mics from mixer companies. <laughs> There's also a Mackie. Mackie's got like four USB mics um, now that just came out of nowhere. I'm not going to go right out of the gate saying these are good mics, but I'm just talking more about the technology. But the Personas Revelator um, is like you're using a console that's inside the mic. And so you can use the mic just as a USB mic or you can load their um, studio live console. And now you've got a full production console that's internal in the mic that allows you to have loop back playbacks that allows you to mix uh, other sources in. It has a uh, processing on the microphone, which it means compression, EQ, like everything you would do in a mixing console with a mic channel is inside the mic now. And it's a $180 microphone. I don't think it's going to be an amazing sounding mic. I can't imagine it's going to be the quietest mic in the out there because you know what a lot of these USB mics is they're doing is they're trying to be everything the every mic for everybody. Right. That's what I that's the problem I have with the Yeti, right? It has a switch that lets you switch all these different patterns, stereo and all these things. It's a little bit silly, but that's what they're doing. So they and they put a lot of capsules inside the mic that let you change to do this and you lose some quality when you have all those tiny little capsules inside there. So we'll see, but this is what some of the new, there's not a whole lot of new to talk about, but this is something that's coming. Yeah. Well, primarily, I mean, if, if a company comes out with this stuff, they're not thinking about us voiceover guys. Nope. They're, they're thinking musicians. You're talking, nope. you know, Billy Eilish in her bedroom with her brother, uh, trying to figure out to get a particular sound for a particular song mm -hmm. or for a particular situation. We're with voiceover. We're just trying to be ourselves in a in a quiet environment. So why do we need all this other Billie stuff? Billie Eilish is in a studio with her brother. Just to be clear about that. No, they, <laughs> not no, the bedroom. They're in the bedroom. It's, it's true, true, though. It's true. It is true. 
I'm thinking by now they probably got something a little one step up. I'm guessing. I don't know. They've moved to oh, their basement. Although I'm a huge, huge fan of this fellow from London named Jacob Collier. Oh, yes. And he's still, still at 25 or whatever he is now doing Grammy, getting Grammys and Grammy, still working in the same bedroom in his parents' house. That's where he does all of his stuff. I you love that. Charging him rent. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, now, speaking of things that are thinking more about voiceover and the needs of a voice actor, and this is kind of a this is a crazy end around to solving a problem that we all know should be solved acoustically. But anyway, the company Townsend Labs that makes the Sphere L22 microphone that I've gotten to test out and did a little review of. This microphone has some interesting tricks up its sleeve. Now, the thing that gets it all the you know, gets very people excited about it is it can make your microphone now sound like a U67. You know, an eight thousand dollar vintage mic is built into your microphone because it emulates other microphones, and we've known about that, and it's really pretty impressive stuff. But what they've done now is they've added this plugin called the Isosphere. And it, what it is, is a sort of a plug-in in a plug-in. It's a module that loads when you're using their, their modeling software. And what it does is, this is the craziest thing, they designed it to, so that when you're using one of these, it doesn't sound so crappy. <laughs> so. Well, isn't it just easier to not use one of those? <laughs> I know. I know, I know that that was the first thing I saw was the guy demoing. Um, uh, I think it was on ProToolsExpert.com, Pro-Tools-Expert. Um, one of the uh, reviewers on there had a video where he was demonstrating this fifteen hundred dollar mic shoved inside this ball of foam. Um, but he was doing it to demonstrate that yes, this does serve a it does serve some purpose, and that is it does soak up some of the room reverb, um, but it doesn't do it without a cost. It definitely ruins the sound of the mic. It changes it a lot. So what this plugin does is it compensates for that. And so it will re-EQ and whatever it needs to do to bring back the original sound of what that mic should have sound like before you shoved it in to an eyeball. And I was like, that is the most, the re most ridiculous thing I ever heard. But then I saw that they have many different uh, products like this in they have a little drop down menu and it's not just one of these it's literally the se reflection filter x the sc on the xe reflection filter pro the a aston halo um the chaotica eyeball with pop filter and without pop filter literally this is in a drop down menu yeah isn't that amazing so they 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 compensated for the acoustical modifications that occur when using all of these products isovox it's in there yeah that's and a very generic foam ball generic foam ball at the bottom <laughs> but they have vocal booth that's the last one and so that's sort of a generic one but it's just designed to soak up the reverb and, and the noise that comes from not being in a a really good studio it's kind of ironic it's like if you're in a vocal booth why do you need a plug-in to make it sound better but that's what they call it and, and then it has one knob just source distance so whatever however the or uh the algorithm works you get to give it an idea of how far away from you work the mic and then you just turn it on there's a youtube video you guys can uh check it out just go on youtube type in isosphere one word by townsend labs and check it out and you can hear the demo um it's a very long video but there is actually a section where they actually record a voice actor in a large, very untreated, very untreated room. And it is pretty good. It it got rid of a lot of the room tone, which is fascinating. It's not using RX, you know, it's not using algorithms to fill scrub out the noise. It's just focusing the microphone's pickup pattern in on the voice and doing it in a really, really effective way. Um, it's pretty interesting technology. This to me is like uh, what the future of these smart mics is going to be. I think in a year or two from now, I think you'll be able to buy a $200 USB mic that just has this built in. And uh, eventually you won't need a whole lot of room acoustics. At the end of the day though, it still sounds like you're in a reverberant room. It doesn't get rid of all the reverb, but it does dramatically improve what would other be otherwise be a not usable voiceover recording. So 
I don't know. It's new. I want to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, they could send me one. I'll be happy to try it out. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could get another L22. I mean, maybe they'll come out with a junior version of that mic. That's a little bit more price point friendly, but you know, it's like if you're using it to emulate an SM seven B kind of a bad investment, you're buying a $1,500 mic to sound like a $400 mic. Right. But if you're trying to emulate a U67, it's a pretty fair price, $1,500 for, for one of these uh, microphones. So anyway. But who would know enough to try and emulate one of these microphones in order to do voiceover? Because, like, well, so you can say you have one? Or the, I don't quite get that. It's, it's a Yeah, it's such an edge case. Like, I, I actually got one for uh, David K last fall. Because he was starting to do a show, and they wanted him to have a U87. <laughs> this is the most insane thing. He has, in his studio, a U67. Mm-hmm. But they're like, nah, no, we want you to have a U87. <laughs> I was just like, okay. They're like, oh, that, that Bentley you drive is too fancy. We'd really rather you just drive a Mercedes. Um, <laughs> it's kind of the weirdest question. But anyway, we couldn't get him a U87. And uh, when it was, I think it was November... They're just not in stock because so many damn people are buying these mics for their home studio. So we got them one of these Townsend Labs Sphere L22s and set it up with a U87 model. And the client and the studio was like, that works for us. So <laughs> weirdest use case, but there you go. Um, anyway, that's it for tech, my, my little tech news update. I suspect there should be a good bit more because this week is NAM. Yeah, really. Um, isn't it weird? I don't think I've missed a NAM show well since I've moved to LA. At least I've been at least 15, 16 NAM shows in a row. So it's a bummer to miss that. Dan, you've been there with me a lot too. And yeah, we've been to a bunch of those. And it's a bit overwhelming, I think. It's overwhelming, but it's still a fun way to discover things. And um, we're not going to be doing that this year. So the, there's like a virtual NAM. And, you know, all the companies are doing press releases and stuff. So there'll be some more stuff to talk about in a couple of weeks when we do our next tech talk. I'll stay tuned and bring you the I, best stuff. Yeah. I want to I want to check out more stuff just so I can say it doesn't make a difference. I, yeah. I, we've done the shootouts and we proved that it's not the interface. It's the face that's facing the microphone and what comes out of it. I'm actually kind of glad I'm not one of those um, YouTubers that I watch, that I watch like, you know, <laughs> Mike Delgadio, the booth junkie and those guys, it's a pain. I mean, they get stuff sent to them all the damn time and their obligation is to get a review of it done and get it up and posted. And, you know, it's, it's, it takes a big chunk of your day and yep. um, I'm glad I don't, I'm not obligated to do that. And I've, I've done enough of those. There's a lot of great, there's a guy named, there's a guy, the guy whose podcast uh, or YouTube channel is called Pos, Podcast Age. That guy, you watch one of his mic reviews. He does them formulaically, identically, every single time. It's very dry, but very informative. So there's other guys out there doing it. <laughs> so Dan, you want to talk about setting levels? Again. Again? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some basic rules around this. Uh, and it still amazes me that people don't quite understand this. Now, there are, you know, this is one of those things where people can have an opinion about it. Because if you're recording at a high bit rate, you can, things can be undermodulated a little bit. 24 and, bit. Yeah, yeah, or overmodulated. And it's going to give you lots of headroom. You can't still over mod. I mean, you if you record in even 32 bit, if you clip your mic preamp, yeah, you still you've clipped. Right. You've already you know there's there are several places to clip audio and distort the audio. Right. But but and as you were saying, I, I I rarely find people over modulating. What I find is people rare. way under modulating. And why, Dan? Why do they do that? I don't know. Because we've only explained it to them about 500 times. And uh, But listen to me. There are specific things. And we set up these parameters when, when we were, you know, we're, and we still are, the World Voices uh, organization. By the way, you should join. Go to world-voices.org. See what we're all about. We're the Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. 
and uh, we're we're starting to make some differences out there. But one of the things we did is we tried to set the standards for home studio voiceover audio, which nobody else did. So you and I and Uncle Roy and Cliff, I, Joe Van Riper was with us, and Jordan Reynolds. We, the guys who know, we're like, it was amazing how fast we agreed on all this stuff. You know, for the most part, Cliff's like, well, no, I can always use this and I can make it and I can twist it and turn it upside down and make it like that. But no, it works best if you do it this, the way you're saying. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to setting levels, you want to modulate. That means get your, you know, the, 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 up, the up and down at least to minus nine consistently and really try and peak between, say, minus six and minus four. Now, in Audacity, it doesn't really measure it. It's got its own little silly scale on to the left. It says 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. You want to modulate in Audacity your peaks, well, not your peaks, but your modulation, your average modulation should be, you know, always going up to about oh, 0 0.04 or 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and then peaking between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7 those numbers don't mean anything because they don't correlate. Yeah. To... Use the meters. Use the, yeah. use the view meters, I think. And really the best way to do that is to, to look at the meter when you're, you know, when you set your levels, it should always be in the green. It should always be in the yellow with it sort of reaching into the orange and red flashing in there. Just occasionally. Right. right. Yeah. If it's just in the green and not in the yellow, you're under modulating. Now, uh, Sue, our director, can we can we go to my my uh, my screen? She did it before you could even finish asking. Oh, she's she rocks. Okay, where is it? We know it's there. There it is. Okay, so let me get so so I can actually see it. A lot of times, this is what it should look like, you know. And if it looks unfamiliar to you, that's because you're not doing it right. But a lot of times, you know, when people send me audio at my specimen collection cup. A lot of times it'll look like this. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the problem with that is it's under modulated and that creates all sorts of problems. You know, and they'll say, my agent says it's not, it's, it, it's noisy. Okay. Well, send me some audio and they'll send me this and I'll go, well, yeah, because if you, if you normalize that and we can talk about normalizing in a second, if you, if you, if you normalize that to say minus three, and but that's your that was your original level. It doesn't only make your regular audio louder; it makes all the noise in the background louder. So, really, you want to be setting your levels on your interface. Say on your 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 two i two, which is right over here, not too far for me to reach. Don't Hopefully. bring over the one we're using for the show. Oh wait a minute, we're not using it for the show. No, we're not using that one for the show right now. We've got this guy here. Uh, and you know, you know, go back to me, Sue. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. But if you if you look at it, you know, with the input dial, mm -hmm. it should be a lot of bit. Well, I've got it set at twelve o'clock. Well, no, you want it set much higher than that, especially on a focus right or any one of these uh, generic interfaces that are out there right now, and go at least to seventy five percent, and and maybe a little bit more. And that will get you back up to the proper levels uh, that you need to be at. You don't want to undermodulate. Two or three o'clock is usually a pretty good starting point. Yeah. You know, and you Twelve o'clock is usually low unless you are a theater actor, in which case you need to learn to stop projecting so much. <laughs> That's the other thing. But we've talked about that as well. Yeah. People yeah. are like, it's a microphone. I have to talk louder. No. no, it's picking you up as you exist, as you're having a conversation. Uh, I don't know why there's so much misinformation out there about this. Well, people also record levels low because they're like, well, I do it low because there's too much noise. I'm like, well, if you're on a date, would you stand 12 feet from your date so they couldn't see that you weren't wearing makeup that night? Would that get you through the date? I don't know. It's kind of like that. <laughs> like, so at some point, you're going to get closer. And at some point with the audio, they're going to have to turn it up. And when they do, the noise will come up as well. So. Yeah, that's not a good workaround. Uh, yeah, it's recording at higher bit rates can be helpful. 
but it's going to make your life better if you just record with a solid, get yourself into the yellow. Yellow is okay, everybody. Don't freak out. Right. And the only exception to this rule would be if you're working with production and they tell you something else. Right. Whatever the producer says wins. So they say, we want peaks at some weird number. Just go, okay, and just do it. Right. But that's unusual. Right. But if your levels are set right and you say you're doing something remotely or you're sending those tracks in, they're going to go, oh, okay, great. They love it. If you've got a good fat signal, you're giving them everything that they can use to make it sound the way they want to make it sound. Not our job to make it sound the way they're going to finally use it. Yeah. So, not when there's an engineer producing this thing. That's their job. Absolutely. Um, they also don't, the engineers don't, don't like normalizing. Um, even though it doesn't necessarily technically screw up the audio, um, they, they, I think they don't like it. And I think the reason they don't like it is I think it's used wrong. A lot of the time it's used as we were saying to just make up the level and then it gets noisy. Or I think people use normalized to zero DB a lot. And that's not a good idea either. The way the engineer doesn't get, want to get a file whose wave is peaking at the very top of the scale. They want audio to have some headroom. It makes it easier for them to produce with. So never normalize to zero for any jobs. Um, minus three is a pretty common, commonly accepted level. Um, but we'll do at the end of the day, if you don't know what they want, just ask. And chances are they'll say, don't do anything. <laughs> just send it to us. Hit record and send it to us. Right. Which what you've got is is fine. Anyway, we've got lots of your questions that you've been sending in, and we're going to get to those and extrapolate on those points to make your voiceover home studio audio the way it's supposed to be right after these messages. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Hey, you and I know that recording from home can be noisy. You need to hear that noise and do all you can to minimize it. So here are the Harlan Hogan Voice Optimized Headphones version 2.0 to the rescue. Good headphones for voiceover playback need to be truth tellers, giving you exactly what you recorded, not colored or too bassy. The H2 Voice Optimized Headphones have incredibly flat response and give you that truth. Other great features include the replaceable plug-in cord and the oh-so-soft Nappa leather ear cups. By the way, VoiceOver Essentials has replacement cords and ear cups both in stock and both ship free in the U.S. Make sure you know exactly what you and your recording space sound like. The Harlan Hogan Voice Optimized Headphones. Get them only from VoiceOverEssentials.com. I use them and so should you. VoiceOverEssentials.com Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the VoiceOver Body Shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Hey, time to talk about Source Connect, I'm assuming, because the camera's on me now. Um, Source-elements.com is the place to sign up and get a Source Connect trial so you can be available to connect to studios all around the world using the tool that many producers prefer to use because it makes their workflow just better. They can plug in a plugin that works directly with uh, Pro Tools and it inserts your audio right into the timeline of their system while it's recording. When the session's over, they've got your audio. It's already in the timeline. It's already synced up. In a lot of cases, it's already been approved by the client because they're listening in on phone patch or whatever they're doing. 
and it's all done. And that that's why they love this kind of workflow. There's a lot of other tools out there, but this one's been in common use in production studios for a long time. I personally have known and used it or set it up for folks for over, over 12 years. So it is definitely a, a, a force to be reckoned with in the recording business. And you want to be ready to use it when that call comes. So if you want to get it set up, you can get a trial, actually. You don't have to spend anything up front to get it tested and running. Just go to source-elements.com to get your account set up and get yourself a trial. You don't have to have an iLock USB dongle key thing anymore for Source Connect standard. So don't worry about that. Get it up and running. And, and uh, if you do need help with that, I also supply support for that as well at georgethetech sc. So anyway, go give it a try. And we thank Source Elements so much for supporting us on VOBS another year. Thanks, guys. I'll be right back. Yep, this is VOBS. Proven anybody can have a show these days. And we're back. We're I, know, I don't know why my clock is at that time, uh, Jim. There's no particular time other than the battery ran out. You know, I, I bought two of these clocks, and I do like them because they have that minute hand that moves smoothly around. Remember the ones in school? You know, where the minute hand doesn't tick. It just moves smooth. It's like this. Yeah, yeah. So I got these clocks that do that. The problem is I found out over trial and error is that that kills the battery <laughs> way faster. So the yeah. kind of tick, tick, ticks, the battery lasts like 10 times longer. These I got to put batteries in like every three freaking months. So yeah, that sort of defeats the purpose of having an accurate. Clock. Thanks for pointing that out, Jim. Yeah. Well, one of the things that George and I really like to do is answer your questions. As a matter of fact, I think that between you and me, that's probably the most favorite thing in our lives is answering people's questions. Um, because most of the time we have the answer because we've answered so many other questions. Uh, but the, the bottom line here is, is we got people sending these questions and you can send in your questions in the chat room, which Jeff Holman is uh, watching carefully tonight. You've got a question for us. Send it in there right now. Uh, but the first question is from Jim Wilson, sort of talking about what we were talking about earlier when it comes to uh, the Chaotica eyeball. He says, given that there wasn't much good to say about the Chaotica eyeball foam mic cover, which it is not, when it debuted, uh, I'd appreciate your thoughts regarding why most of the photos I see of shotgun mics have the foam covering still on them. What's a good reason to leave it on in a recording environment when the wind isn't a factor? Which, if you're in a recording environment, wind really shouldn't even be part of the equation. Uh, <laughs> even the famous host of VOBS, I think he means you, has a foam cover on his road shotgun. Your thoughts? This <laughs> one right here? You'll notice he's not using it this evening. Well, that's because I read this question, and I thought that would be uh, silly to have it on after he I got lambasted for having it uh, by Mark Cashman too. Um, yeah, you don't you don't need a pop screen with proper mic placement, proper technique, and a voiceover studio. You don't need a windscreen. You don't need a pop screen. You don't need any of those things because if you use your pro proper mic technique, you're good. The one reason I think I keep putting this thing back on is it would just be rolling around on my desk and would get lost. That's one reason. To know sort of like I, why I never take my glasses off because otherwise I'd lose it. <laughs> Two, um, I, this and this is this is something to think about. Um, I do use headphones all day long when I'm doing Zoom sessions. I'm, you know, doing tech support all day, talking into this microphone, and I get the I sort of get that DJ effect. I get so used to the way I sound when I'm right up on the mic that I'm always eating the damn mic because I want to hear the way that sounds in my headphones. So, and when I do that, then the pops start slipping in there and that drives me nuts. So then I put the windscreen back on and the windscreen does reduce a little bit of the plosives. It also keeps me from eating the mic as much when it's sticking out, like say about here. Okay. Um, Sue, <laughs> we'll, we'll hold for Sue. Holding on a second. Oh, Yep, everything's good, Sue. Yeah, I can't hear her, but yes, we are. Let me make sure we're, our stream is going. Still looks Stand like it's going. 
It's going on YouTube and it's going on Facebook. Everything's still five by five, Sue. Okay. Worst case scenario, we'll just roll out the show in this in this shot. Yeah. Uh, thank the world. Okay. Anyway. So anyway, so where was I? So Okay. So the windscreen is a no no in most cases, but for me it sometimes is a helper. Sometimes it helps me a little bit guide where I'm going to be on the mic. And it does sometimes help reduce plosives from time to time. But this is an entirely different deal than this. <laughs> the eyeball, the whole idea behind this is it's trying to soak up some of the room ambience around the microphone and get rid of it so you have less reverb. Um, it does that okay. Um, as you saw earlier in my tech talk, it definitely colors the sound. And so it's it's enough of a problem that a company came out with a plugin to correct for the problem caused by having something around your microphone like this. So um, it's a very different animal, but that's what the chaotic eyeball is for. Yeah. I mean, it makes a great volleyball, but to me, that's about all it's really good for. I mean, why take a $10,000 mic that they've spent millions of dollars of acoustical research and how uh, the sound goes through it and shove it in, you know, in a bagel. <laughs> in a bagel. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. And that's why they give away so many of them. Because the, they don't cost a lot to make. I can guarantee it. Yeah. And they're not cheap to buy. So. Right. Anyway, uh, yeah. It's. Yeah. The windscreen is a windscreen. The, the, the chaotic eyeball is not a windscreen. It has a windscreen on it. It does have one. Yes. But it to me, that just makes people use bad mic technique. But then again, it was not designed for voiceover, but it certainly has been marketed to voiceover. It was really for singers that want to eat the, eat the mic and get that really up close sound. And that's what yeah. it was for. Okay. Right. Moving now, on. Jeff Holman's question. Jeff. Because Jeff really wanted to ask this question. So I'll let you read his question. He says, uh, my Sennheiser ME66 shotgun mic has a built-in low-frequency roll-off filter at 100 hertz. Um, I've read it is minus 10 dB at 100 hertz slash minus 20 dB at 50 hertz. Where is that like a high-pass filter? Uh, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> what they're describing when they talk about minus 10 dB, minus 20 dB, is this is how much the 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 sound is reduced at those different frequencies? So they're saying at 100 hertz, it reduces it by about minus 10, and at 50 hertz, it reduces it by minus 20. That tells me that that's not a very suitable uh, high pass or low cut for voiceover work, because that's going to take away 10 dB at 100 hertz, which is a lot of the base of your voice. That's like the lowest end of your voice. That's the basement kind of fundamental of your voice. It's going to thin it out quite a bit, I think. Don't you think, Dan? At 100, yeah, I usually will. It really depends on the per individual because everybody's voice is different. And I have found that certainly on female voices, they rarely go down to 100 hertz, uh, maybe 125 hertz. Uh, some guys' voices who are just, you just have that kind of a voice uh yeah you don't want to you don't want to really you know cut out too much below 80 and uh, i know some of our, our our engineer friends uh you know who talk about this are like well you know if you cut it out at you know at you know a little above 80 it might actually take out some resonance and my thoughts are no one's going to tell the difference and if you've got a rumble down there that's increasing your noise floor even though it's somewhat inaudible that's okay but yeah, a, a roll off at a hundred Hertz, it really should probably be at 80. So, you know, but then again, what is that? The, 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 the 66 design for, but there's um, only one way to find out and that's to hear it. That's right. Because every voice is different. That's right. And every room is different. So if you're in a boomy, very bottom heavy, small room, then that actually could work out in your favor to have to take away some of the low end. So you don't know. Yeah. And I also found that, you know, a lot of people think that they're, you know, they have a very reverberant room because, 
you know, it sounds like they have, you know, a little bit of bass reflex when in reality they're just eating the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't do that. Alrighty. Okay. Next. Uh, oh, and it, how important is it to have a shock mount? Not really very important at all, to be honest, because you're not, the shock mounts are really important for hand holding a mic on a boom pole because you'll get sound transmitted from your hand down the pole and you don't want to get that in the mic, but the mic in your studio is firmly mounted and uh, you know, you're not recording 20 Hertz. You're not recording extremely low frequency stuff. So technically you don't really need a shock mount for the 416. It'll work fine with the clip I have found in pretty much most all cases. So I have as well a uh, question from demigods music Q. Great name. Go for it. Looking at doing some basic room treatment, and there's super cheap Amazon foam. Yeah, there sure is. Um, or pretty pricey GIK acoustic panels. Can't seem to find anything mid priced, which has a good balance of price and performance. Any suggestions? Well, yeah, there definitely is. I mean, GIK has some affordable stuff, but they also have some really fancy ones with wood freight wood faces that do diffusion and all this kind of stuff um i think the most reasonably priced and i've been using their products for many 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 years and have always had good success are from a company called ats acoustics um i think they're bang for the buck extremely hard to beat they're about 35 bucks for a two by two panel wrapped in fabric two inches thick and you know, you the thing you have to remember is you get much more effectiveness out of a two by two properly made panel that's lined with Roxel, uh, which is a much better material than the foam. And so you don't need as the sheer volume of material that you do when you use foam. The foam just isn't as effective per square foot. So when you really price it all out, those panels, buying a few of those properly made panels or making them yourself actually end up being very similar in price, sometimes even cheaper. So, um, you know, using the right things, putting them in the right place, made the right way, can save you money. So, hope that helps. All righty. Uh, Brad Giffen asks, uh, Onward to Tech Talk. George, I've enjoyed your YouTube videos that offer tips, tricks, and techniques about Twisted Wave. A lot of great hidden gems. But instead of hunting and hopping from video to video, George, do you offer for a single or offer for sale a single comprehensive twisted wave course from soup to nuts, so to speak? Checks in the mail, Brad. Um <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. That's on my 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 list for this year is to start producing tutorial videos for sale as I've done in the past. Um, and uh, that's what I want to do. I want to have like a video that's pretty comprehensive that you'll learn everything that you want to know about Twisted Wave in one video. So that is in the works, Brad. Thanks for asking, asking and you know, definitely stay tuned. Of course, as soon as I launch them, you guys will know here because I'll certainly plug them. But uh, I'll have info at georgethe.tech when I do get to them. Um, the number one software requested, by the way, for this video production work is uh, Adobe Audition. So I'm starting with Adobe Audition because that was the most asked for. I actually do have a little survey on my website. Which one do you want to learn first? You know, there's a whole thing you can fill out. But Twisted Wave was a close second. So that would be the next one I'll do. So yeah, probably by mid, mid spring, I'll have all these videos in the queue. So Excellent. hope you're patient. <laughs> if you need any help with those, George, I am available. That would be fun, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, ah, great question from Jim McNicholas with a single word answer. George was thinking of tossing a DBX 286 in line to treat the sound a tiny bit. Good idea. Mm. No. <laughs> I think the only thing that thing that's good for is the high pass filter. It's kind of a silly thing to buy just for that one feature. No, I don't really recommend it. It's a great thing for podcasters who are just trying to get reasonably good loud audio with the least amount of noise possible, but it's kind of a blunt instrument. It's not the best quality audio you're going to get from a unit. It's no, not for voiceover. It's really designed really for, as you were saying for podcasting, although broadcasting, 
long before podcasting was even a word. It was designed for live broadcast. This is mm -hmm. something that would be in a, in a in a television studio or a radio studio uh, to keep a, a consistent level because we're always talking about keeping a consistent level. And the 286, you know, it's got, you know, I think it's got a, a, you know, a noise gate on it and it all does. this stuff. Expander, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're not big fans of channel strips and front end processing because once you record it with something like that, it's there forever. You can't, you can't You're married it. to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and therefore, I guess the question really comes down to, you know, it says to, to, you know, to treat the sound a tiny, tiny bit, treat it for what? Yeah. That would be the question. What are you trying to fix by adding that? Right. That's really what that would more inform the opinion of whether it's useful for you, what you need or not. Exactly. Uh, let's see here. Question from Brad Geffen. Go for it. Uh, can one make a case for purchasing an Apollo twin if one is simply providing raw voice for commercials that, you know, no processing? Um, why would I? Yeah, basically, why would I use the Apollo twin if I'm not going to use the processing, I guess, is the question. Sort of that's a tough thing that that's a tough thing to justify in my mind. I mean, when there's things like the SSL uh, two uh, USB audio interface, which is amazing. There's new Audient products out now, the ID four Mark II, uh, which is apparently really good. I'm hoping it is stands the test of time to be good. But there's just so many other far less expensive but great sounding interfaces. That, okay, but you wanted to know. If you have two microphones and you want to have a very seamless workflow that allows you to switch between them at any time and then have your software be able to hear either microphone without having to muck around with a lot of settings, yes, the Adobe, the, the Apollo Twin makes that pretty easy if you know what you're doing. <laughs> it's not easy unless you know how to set it up to do that, and that's not easy. But once it is set up for you by someone like myself that sets these things up for folks, it does make that kind of thing easy. So there are things that can do really well, but for for the cost, it's a little bit persnickety. Uh, the interface is a little hard to learn. It doesn't work well with Zoom uh, at all. It does weird stuff with Zoom. So yeah, it's a real caveat emptor kind of situation. Talk to me more offline about that, Brad. Yeah, yeah. We got one more question here, but I'm going to wait a week on it. Okay. Because because he's asking about about EQ and all this stuff. If it's oh, really, we need more time to unpack that one, I think. Well, not only that, but I want to hear it. Yeah, and we're always talking about you know. I need to hear stuff. You know, is it a buzz or is it a hum? Well, no, it's not actually a buzz or a hum. It's actually a rumble. Or you know, George and I have have terminology for what things are, and we know what each one of those things is and what usually causes them. So uh, we also know whistle. What it's supposed what it's to supposed to sound like, right? <laughs> so David uh, Kahuru, if you're watching, send us a sample so we know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, has has to do with he's applying some stuff and it's changing the sound. Well, of course it's going to change the sound, but let's give it a listen and then we'll move on from there. Sure, but sounds good. Those are all the questions we got this week, and they were all great ones. And uh, done and done. So we'll be right back after these messages to wind things up and tell you know tell you what's coming up next right after this you're watching vobs.tv i don't know why it's crazy what they do here i think i'm gonna go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich um, you hear a lot about audiobooks that it's an awful lot of work and not a lot of money and when i hear that i think to myself man i wish i could help that person understand that yeah not everybody makes a ton of dough in audiobooks but you won't do yourself any favors if you just try things out, see what sticks, and you don't get proper training and put in a good system, a good production flow. I teach a course called the ACX Masterclass, and we're about to launch our winter 2021 series. We've got a series of three free videos about this very thing, how much opportunity there is and sometimes how little money there is in return and how to fix that. Go to acxmasterclass.com. That's ACX masterclass.com watch the videos we'll open up registration for the acx masterclass real soon uh, and we'll give you a discount as well for watching vobs acx masterclass.com thanks 
In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Yep, this is VOBS. Proven anybody can have a show these days. And we're back with Mr. Widom. Mixing audio is hard. <laughs> it can it can be. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not it, the system we're using tonight. It, you know, when you hit play, you have no control over the level. It just is what it is. So, <laughs> working on that, getting the levels matched oh, again. Post. <laughs> every week. Uh, okay, next week on this show, Debbie Derryberry will be with us. A little, you know, two foot pile of dynamite. Uh, <laughs> a little taller than that. A uh, wonderful lady, uh, voice of Jimmy Neutron, and a lot of other great uh, animation voices, and a very and a marvelous musician. Uh, so, we'll talk to her about animation and character voices next week. So, make sure you're around for that. Uh, I know we have Marilyn Wisner coming on in a couple of weeks. She'll be with us, I believe, March first. And uh, so, I'm booking way ahead now. I love it. You know, I, it feels good. I'm doubling down. I'm getting all the good people. Awesome. Yeah, uh, sure. Anyway, who are our donors of the week? Well, we've got Michael Kearns, Christy Burns, Graham Spicer, Sonia Mobley, Michelle Blanker, Christopher Epperson, Sarah Borges, and Philip Sapir. I should by now have those names memorized because they've been subscribing and sending us a little bit of money every month for a oh, really long time. And now they get a crawler. And they have a crawl. Look at that. Do, 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 do. Wait, do, do, do. Wow. It's cool. We love our technology, don't we? We do. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's yes. nice. It's like nice Harlan, to have you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOverEssentials.com, VoiceOver Extra, Source Elements, who make Source Connect, VOHeroes.com, VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC demos. All righty. Uh, thanks to Jeff Holman for uh, monitoring the chat room tonight and relaying all those questions. Uh, yes. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, that's Jeff's voice. Yeah. Uh, our technical director, Sue Merlino, who's just pulling her hair out. Yay! She's over there. Is she she's over there. She's going to show us her picture? Or... She did. Yeah. Okay, good. Hi, Sue. Thanks for all the work you do and for your dedication to our show. Which is really for good. sure. Uh, we really appreciate it. And Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Anyway, that's going to do it for us this week. If you got questions for us, write to us at the guys at vobs.tv. Uh, if you want to work with George, you can go over to George the dot tech. And if you want to work with me, go on over to homevoiceoverstudio.com. See how quick she picked up on that and just the room right in there. love it seamless all righty uh hey look we're here to help you with your home's voiceover studio and getting your audio sounding the way it's supposed to but look if it sounds good it is good that's going to do it for us this week i'm dan leonard and i'm george Whitham. and this is voiceover body shop or vo b s tech talk tech talk tech talk tech talk tech talk tech talk, tech talk. Tech talk. Tech talk. Tech talk. See you next week, guys. Thanks for joining us.